At the turn of the century, vaudeville was a pretty prominent form of entertainment in America. It was funny, the songs were catchy, and it didn't have any one cohesive storyline. It could almost be considered a precursor to what we know today as the Broadway musical. But why is that? Why do we still remember it the way we do? That's what we're going to learn all about in today's video. But first, I want to officially welcome anyone who's new to my channel. Here at From Laura's Perspective, I post a new video essay at least once a week on a wide array of topics. These videos are divided by topic into series and playlists, which you can check out by visiting my channel page. If you find my essays intriguing and insightful, subscribe to my channel and that's your card to my YouTube library. To ensure you don't miss out on any of my content, tap the bell icon. So what essentially was vaudeville? Despite being such an important part of American history, vaudeville actually originated in France. A vaudeville was originally meant to be a comedy without psychological or moral intentions based solely around a comical situation. A dramatic composition or light poetry interspersed with songs or ballets. Like we Americans have done with many things, we completely changed the idea of vaudeville theater when it was popular in the United States between the 1880s and 1930s. A typical North American vaudeville performance was made up of a series of separate, unrelated acts grouped together on a common bill. Types of acts have included popular and classical musicians, singers, dancers, comedians, trained animals, magicians, ventriloquists, strongmen, female and male impersonators, acrobats, clowns, illustrated songs, jugglers, one-act plays or scenes from plays, athletes, lecturing celebrities, minstrels, and films. A vaudeville performer is often referred to as a vaudevillian. The origin of the term is obscure, but often explained as being derived from the French expression vaudeville, or voice of the city. A second speculation is that it comes from the 15th century songs on satire by poet Olivier Vosselin, Va de Vire. In his Connections television series, science historian James Burke argues that the term is a corruption of the French Va de Vire, Vire River Valley in English, an area known for its body drinking songs where Vosselin lived. So how did vaudeville spread and become so popular? Vaudeville spread throughout the United States, mostly through a chain of theaters set aside for this purpose, opened by B.F. Keith and managed by Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf playwright Edward Albee's adoptive grandfather E.F. Albee. E.F. wanted vaudeville acts to be G-rated, you know, so that men, women, and children alike could enjoy them. Though they probably wouldn't even use that metaphor since the MPAA rating system hadn't even been developed yet. Instead, he called the standard he wanted vaudeville acts to meet polite entertainment. I've actually made a video all about the development of the MPAA rating system, definitions of each rating, and the controversy stirred up by the system. It's actually one of the more popular among the essays in my video essay library. I've included a link to this video both in the description and on your end screen. But for now, back to Albie and Vaudeville. Albie even admonished those involved with more risque acts threatening to ban them from performing if they kept on. But many of them didn't want to listen, and some even made the content of their vaudeville acts even more risque to rebel against what they saw as a form of censorship. Some of the words Albie was referring to weren't even that risque. He was referring to slang terms such as slob or son of a gun. Actors who really didn't want to follow the rules of polite entertainment could have just quit, but then they would be given a black mark on their name, meaning B.F. Keith would never hire them again. 
Most of these actors decided they would rather cave in on polite entertainment than kiss their careers in vaudeville goodbye. By the late 1890s, vaudeville had large circuits or houses in almost every sizable location, standardized booking, broad pools of skilled acts, and a loyal national following. One of the biggest circuits was Martin Beck's Orpheum Circuit. It incorporated in 1919 and brought together 45 vaudeville theaters in 36 cities throughout the United States and Canada and a large interest in two vaudeville circuits. Another major circuit was that of Alexander Pantages. In his heyday, Pantages owned more than 30 vaudeville theaters and controlled at least 60 in both the United States and Canada through management contracts. At one point, the phrase, will it play in Peoria, became a metaphor for the probable success, or in some cases lack thereof, of a vaudeville act. This was in reference to the concept that if an act succeeded on a vaudeville circuit in Peoria, Illinois, it would be just as successful anywhere else. In fact, it was this phrase that put the city of Peoria, Illinois on the map, becoming much more notable and popular than it was before. There were three levels of vaudeville speaking from the actor's perspective small time or lower paying contracts for more frequent performances in rougher, often converted theaters. Medium time involved moderate wages for two performances each day in theaters built for that purpose. Big time meant possible remuneration of several thousand dollars per week in large, urban theaters largely patronized by the middle and upper middle classes. Vaudeville performers generally worked their way up from small time to big time. Here's how vaudeville shows generally went. They opened with a sketch, then moved on to a one man or one woman performance, usually either a singer or juggler, then there was an acrobatic act known as an alley-oop, then another one-person performance, and finally, a closing sketch. If you know anything about blackface comedy, you know that it was horribly racist, but a norm of its time. Next, let's talk about the importance of women in vaudeville theater. Sexism ran pretty rampant in the entertainment industry at the turn of the century, just as you could say it still does today. But that doesn't mean women didn't have an important role in vaudeville. In the 1920s came about the use of all-girl bands or all-girl revue groups, with two notable examples being the Ingenues, pictured up on your screen, and the Dixie Sweethearts, of whom I couldn't find any pictures. You could almost say that the inclusion of women in vaudeville was one of the earliest examples of the inclusion of women in the theater industry, as well as of the expansion of the public role of women. You could even say that they were precursors to the archetype of the modern Broadway actress. Some of the most famous solo vaudeville actresses include Marie Dressler, Trixie Fraganza, and Mary Irwin, of whom there are pictures up on your screen. Now that we've heard about women, let's talk about immigrants in vaudeville, particularly the Irish. In addition to vaudeville's prominence as a form of American entertainment, it reflected the newly evolving urban inner city culture and interaction of its operators and audience making up a large portion of immigration to the United States in the mid-19th century, Irish Americans interacted with established Americans, with the Irish becoming subject to discrimination due to their ethnic, physical, and cultural characteristics. In one such example, vaudeville performers would play Irish American characters and portray them as ignorant, inexperienced, uneducated fools as a reference to their newcomer status as immigrant Americans. Following the Irish immigration wave, 
Several waves followed in which new immigrants from different backgrounds came in contact with the Irish in America's urban centers. Already settled and being native English speakers, Irish Americans took hold of these advantages and began to assert their positions in the immigrant racial hierarchy based on skin tone and assimilation status, cementing job positions that were previously unavailable to them as recently arrived immigrants. As a result, Irish Americans became prominent in vaudeville entertainment as curators and actors, creating a uniquely ethnic interplay between Irish American use of self-deprecating humor and their diverse inner city surroundings. At the same time, Immigrant vaudeville actors also made it a point to turn the tables and make the hostile immigrant experience a central theme of some vaudeville acts as a form of comic relief. This trend continued as American theater evolved, but I actually already have plans to make a whole video about that in the future. You'd think Irish Americans and African Americans would have some empathy for each other, with the former being immigrants and the latter having used to be slaves. But no. The Irish were on the lower rungs of American society, so they promoted blackface comedy acts as a way to boost their own status by throwing African Americans under the bus. So if vaudeville was so popular in its heyday, why don't we see it much today? For vaudeville, the growth of lower-priced cinema in the 1910s was the beginning of the end. The funny thing about this is that vaudeville halls were where cinema was first commercially shown. This had the side effect of luring vaudeville actors away from live theater and into the film industry, where they would receive higher salaries and work in better conditions. Notable examples include Al Johnson, W.C. Fields, Mae West, Buster Keaton, The Marx Brothers, Jimmy Durante, Bill Bojangles Robinson, Edgar Bergen, Fanny Bryce, Burns and Allen, and Eddie Cantor. The line between live and filmed performances was blurred by the number of vaudeville entrepreneurs who made more or less successful forays into the movie business. For example, Alexander Pantages quickly realized the importance of motion pictures as a form of entertainment. He incorporated them in his shows as early as 1902. Later, he entered into a partnership with the famous players Lasky, a major Hollywood production company and an affiliate of Paramount Pictures. By the late 1920s, small selections of cinema became part of the common bill for vaudeville performances. Vaudevillians knew they were at odds with the growing industry of cinema, but held out hope that the silent nature of the flickering shadow sweethearts would preclude their usurpation of the paramount place in the public's affection. With the introduction of talking pictures in 1926, the burgeoning film studios removed what had remained the chief difference in favor of live theatrical performance, spoken dialogue. Inevitably, managers had to further trim costs by eliminating the last of live performances. Vaudeville also suffered due to the rise of broadcast radio following the greater availability of inexpensive receiver sets in the, later in the decade. Even the hardiest in the vaudeville industry realized the form was in decline and it wasn't coming back anytime soon. When the distribution of films with sound was standardized in the 1930s, that was the official end of vaudeville. By 1930, the vast majority of formerly live theaters had been wired for sound and none of the major studios were producing silent pictures. For a time, the most luxurious theaters continued to offer live entertainment, but the Great Depression forced most theaters to economize. But did live performances at the theater die out? No way. In fact, it still hasn't. So why do we remember vaudeville the way we do in 2023? As I mentioned in the last section, many of the first actors in cinema were once vaudeville performers. 
Their experience on the vaudeville stage prepared them to act in the booming film industry. But it's not just film that vaudeville led to. It also contributed to the growth of radio and television. Comedies of the new era adopted many of the dramatic and musical tropes of classic vaudeville acts. Film comedies of the 1920s through the 1940s used talent from the vaudeville stage and followed a vaudeville aesthetic of variety entertainment, both in Hollywood and in Asia, including China. Even to this day, we make lots of references to vaudeville theater. Ever use slang terms such as flop or gag? You wouldn't if they hadn't been used in vaudeville acts. Though not credited often, Vaudevillian techniques can commonly be witnessed on television and in movies, notably in the recent worldwide phenomenon of TV shows such as America's Got Talent. Since 2018, there's even been a thing called VaudevilleCon. Hence its name, it's a gathering to celebrate the history of vaudeville. It was all started by noted film director Christopher Anino maker of a new silent feature film, Silent Times, and the convention was first hosted in Pawcatuck, Connecticut. What was the most interesting thing you learned about vaudeville today? That this so-called American entertainment comes from France? That Irish immigrants used self-deprecating humor in vaudeville? That it paved the way for more modern forms of entertainment? Anything else? Let me know in the comments down below. Since you apparently learned something, also make sure to tap the like button. I make lots of videos on the theater industry, which you can find the link to up on your screen, but that's not the only thing I make content about here at From Laura's Perspective. If you liked what you saw today and want even more, hit subscribe already. Once you've done that, comment below, I subscribed.